Another Good English. evening, everybody. So, my name is Jackie Troy, and I'm the Director of Research, Indigenous Social and Cultural Wellbeing at the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. And uh, it's my particular pleasure to uh, welcome you all to hear um, Professor Leanne Hinton speaking about reclaiming Indigenous languages and particularly the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program, which she has been a key mastermind in developing and is now um, helping us in Australia to understand and which will lead to a lot of important language work here, further important language work. And it, as the representative from IATSIS, um, we're, and we've had the privilege of also being um, co-funders in this um, evening's proceedings. We also had the privilege of having Leanne give a, a wonderful seminar at IATSIS on Monday, so I'd like to thank her once again for that event. It was terrific. And a number of you who are in the audience participated on the panel. And as the IATSIS representative, and also as a person who's descended from people whose traditional country came down into this area, the Narugu people, um, I would like to say that it is a great privilege to be here on the traditional country of um, a range of groups, including Ngunnawal, Ngamri, Walgaloo, Narugu, but particularly the Ngunnawal people. And um, it's uh, a time to acknowledge the elders, past and present, and the living community here, which many of you who live here in Canberra participate with all the time. So. Thank you for having us here. This is about our languages and reclaiming them. And I'd like to hand over now to Sarah, Dr. Sarah Ogilvie. Or is it Professor Sarah Ogilvie? Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you for your welcome to country and to you and your colleagues you. at IATSIS, at the Centre for Aboriginal and Australian Languages for the generous sponsorship of this lecture. Thanks to your sponsorship, we're able, able to film it, and therefore Aboriginal communities around Australia can, can watch it. And we're also able to have a wine and cheese function after this, and you are all welcome at that. So good evening. My name is Sarah Ogilvie, and I'm the director of the Australian National Dictionary Centre here at ANU. And it's a particular delight and honour that Professor Leanne Hinton accepted our invitation to be a visiting fellow at the centre for this month, which has meant that we've all um, had the chance to enjoy her spending time with us here at ANU. I must say she's been a real hit at the centre and we're very sad that, that she's leaving tomorrow. At the Australian National Dictionary Centre, we've always <coughs> rightly concentrated on Australian English but um, we hope in the future to expand our remit to provide scope for work and collaborations on indigenous languages of our nation. So Professor Hinton's presence with us is therefore an important indication of one of our future directions which we hope that the center will take. Internationally known for her research on language loss and language revitalization, she has written numerous books and articles and consults with indigenous communities around the world, as she has for the past two weeks in Alice Springs and Kununurra. Leanne Hinton is a professor emerita in the linguistics department at the University of, at the University of California, Berkeley. She is a founder and advisory board member of the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. Her books on language revitalization include Flutes of Fire, the famous Green Book of Language Revitalization in Practice, How to Keep Your Language Alive, which is the manual for the Master Apprentice pro program, which we are going to hear more of tonight. And her current book is Bringing Our Languages Home, Language Revitalization for Families. Professor Hinton's work has been widely recognized as groundbreaking in the field of language revitalization. In 2006, she won the Cultural Freedom Award from the Lenan Foundation. And earlier this year, in January, the Linguistic Society of America awarded her the Language, Linguistics and the Public Award. This evening, she's going to speak to us on reclaiming indigenous languages 
using the Master Apprentice program in North America and here in Australia. It's a very great pleasure to welcome Professor Leanne Hinton. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. I, I want to thank the three organizations that are hosting the lecture, the Australian um, National Dictionary Center, and to Sarah for all of the great hosting that she has uh, given me while I'm here, uh, as well as to Julia, who's here, the, um, and the staff who helped me become a, a visiting scholar. And, uh, and I, I'm going to miss the morning teas so much. Uh, <laughs> And um, also to IETSIS, um, to Jackie, and to uh, others for the tours they gave me and for having me there Monday for that wonderful panel. And, um, and thank you for the welcome to country. And to Jane Simpson and, and other folks that uh, are in charge of this uh, seminar series, Big Ideas on Language. Thank you for that. So, um, I was here uh, primarily to go spend two weeks out in uh, Alice Springs in Kununurra in a Training the Trainers seminar, or two Training the Trainers workshops. And for that I have to thank uh, many people, but especially Margaret Flory and her staff at RNLD, Reynolds, the uh, resource network for linguistic diversity. And I, I also want to thank uh, Wallace McKittrick of the Indigenous Languages Support Program in the Office for the Arts, a program of the Australian federal government. I'm going to lead up to the Master Apprentice Program and the workshops through a uh, somewhat lengthy introduction, and so bear with me. Um, what you're seeing on the screen now is the first sentence in an influential set of articles uh, written by Ken Hale, Michael Krauss, and several of their colleagues for the American Journal Language in 1992. It was subsumed under the uh, title Endangered Languages, and it sounded an alarm about the loss of linguistic diversity around the world. And I think it was one of the key events that led to a new era of linguistic uh, language documentation in linguistics, it, which is a venerable field, but it had lost uh, steam in the latter half of the 20th century. And um, um, one of the uh, quotes from it is from Krauss, where he says, obviously for scientific purposes, it's most urgent to document languages before they disappear. And he also talked about how the work was potentially of equal or greater importance uh, for the communities who were being documented. And indeed, the, the new documentation is uh, uh, it's a wonderful trend. There's a, a lot going on now in Australia, as well as the United States and South America, and just about everywhere. Um, it's aided by great advances in technology, and it focuses on uh, frequently, not always, on massive documentation for many people and many genres, including a new focus on everyday conversation, which is enormously important for uh, language revitalization. And um, it allows for, uh, the new documentation allows for digital archiving and possibilities for immediate dissemination of materials, even while people are still in the field. Um, and there's a new ethics where community is partner and fellow decision maker, along with some or total, even sometimes, intellectual property rights. But, um, and I was, uh, the seminar that uh, we were in on Monday, I was talking about how documentation is used for language revitalization and has been uh, very important to some very successful uh, uh, people in revitalizing their languages. But the idea that uh, documentation saves languages is a view of linguists, but it's not necessarily shared by indigenous people who still have speakers, especially. As some language activists in California put it, documentation is just pickling my language. So the most common goal 
in language revitalization is new speakers. And what happens is that indigenous communities often feel that documentation should take second place to a focus on language teaching and language learning. Um, I'll give you a quote from Richard Ground, PhD in Princeton from the Theological Seminary there, and project director for the Yuchi Language Project in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. He's also a member of the Yuchi tribe, and he and his two children are fluent second language learners of the Yuchi language, working with the elders. So Ground's viewpoint is, as he says in, in an article in 2007, the climax came when the linguist offered the idea to the Yuchis that they would have a dictionary on their shelves a hundred years from now. I countered that a hundred years from now, I wanted Yuchis to have the language on their tongues. In the end, the dictionary option won out. He was very bitter about that. The Yuchi language project had to divide the elders' time with the dictionary project. He was hoping the elders could spend full time with language uh, teaching and learning. So once again, the goal of language revitalization is new speakers. And documentation in itself does not bring new speakers. Uh, sometimes people can use documentation uh, to develop new speakers. But the real problem is how to get new speakers when natural transmission in the home is no longer happening. So what's working? And I'm gonna just go through this fairly quickly. One of the uh, things that's working really well is uh, immersion schools and language nests in uh, New Zealand and Hawaii. Those are the special models. Here's uh, some pictures from um, the school Nawahi Okalani Opu'u in Hilo, Hawaii. And there's also some smaller uh, programs. I mean, Maori and, and Hawaiian have uh, large numbers now of schools all over, uh, all over the state of Hawaii and the country of, of New Zealand. Um, there's some smaller schools too on the mainland in the United States, such as the Cutswood School uh, in Montana for Blackfeet. And uh, this picture is the entire student body of the single school that they have. It goes from uh, kindergarten through the eighth grade and then after that, kids have to go to the uh, English language public school. Uh, here's another one, the Aquasasnis Freedom School, Mohawk. Sorry for the fuzzy picture there. Um, and that's pre-K through ninth grade, and then kids go to English language school. So the larger tribes on the mainland can do immersion schools too, um, although they're smaller in scope. but. Uh, smaller groups with only a few speakers would find it almost impossible, if not completely impossible, to have such schools, at least for the present. Language survival schools are, um, as they're often called, are the most effective means of developing new speakers of endangered languages that are not being used at home. And that's because children learn language at a young age. They become fully fluent in the language. Um, there's relatively large new numbers of new speakers that can be generated all at once. Uh, it also allows the development of a culture and a community of language revitalization. So uh, not only is the language being taught and the values and the culture uh, within the schools, but um, uh, also language activism. And over 20 years of survival schools in Hawaii and New Zealand show that at least in the good schools, and Nawahi is one of those, that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, that uh, children are successful in school. About 90% of the kids from Nawahi go to college. They're fluent in Hawaiian or Maori, as well as English. And of those who have children so far, many are committed to raising their, uh, their, language, uh, their children in the language. So why are there so many language survival schools in Hawaii and New Zealand, but not in Australia or mainland USA? Well, it, the answer is pretty obvious. Hawaii and New Zealand have only one indigenous language each. 
And that means there's relatively large populations that allow a large pool of teachers to teach in the schools. And because there's only one language in each place, both the government and the universities have large programs for teaching the language to young adults at the university level, uh, which are then the people that most often uh, are the teachers in the school, because there are not uh, very many young adults who grew up using the language at home. This is changing, of course, because the people that went to the school, many of them are coming back as teachers now. So in Hawaii, for example, you can actually go on to the University of Hawaii after graduating from a, a Hawaiian uh, immersion school, and you can major in Hawaiian studies if you are so inclined, and all the courses that you take will be in the Hawaiian language, whether it's courses in history, natural history, or whatever. Uh, you can now get a PhD in, uh, in um, indigenous uh, language revitalization studies in Hawaii. You still have almost all of your courses be in the Hawaiian language. Well, so those are the riches of having only one language per uh, state. Now here's Australia, each one of those little colors is a different language. And the United States, this isn't a good comparison map. The United States is just as uh, diverse as uh, Australia is. It's just that these colors represent language stocks instead of single languages. So here's a little better map um, for showing just part of the United States. It's California. And even this has uh, um, some f language families that are melted together, like Pomo is actually uh, seven languages rather than just one. Um, <clears throat> but you can also see in California, and this is typical of what's going on in both uh, the United States and Australia. Uh, if you look at this, this is a map that uh, um, is the result of a study I did in 1992 of the number of speakers of California Indian languages. And so each number represents how many speakers there are. And you can see a whole lot of zeros. So out of almost 100 languages that were originally in California, um, at least a third of them have no speakers left alive. Uh, and, and of course, this was done in 1992. And so the, the situation has changed a good deal. Yurok, for example, which in 1992 had 20 or 30 speakers, now has two or three speakers, and none, and none of those two or three are really as fluent as the best speakers were 20 years ago. So you can, you can look at every single language and see the same thing going on. So um, immersion schools in these linguistically diverse situations with very small numbers of speakers and often very small tribes are difficult or impossible to develop and maintain. Um, and, and universities can't provide the teachers to the schools either uh, when you've got 100 languages or 250 languages or in order to, uh, to try to people. So what are the smaller groups doing? They're still doing a lot. So they have uh, immersion camps, a lot of uh, immersion camps, summer camps, uh, daily or weekly language classes in the schools or outside the schools. Um, people that have been able to learn their language as a second language are sometimes using it at home. This is a Miami child from Oklahoma. Uh, she was at the time being homeschooled in the Miami language and uh, her family all speaks Miami. And I should say that um, the idea of an immersion a school or language nest is not impossible, it's just really hard. I had an email that I saw just five minutes before coming here from a friend of mine who's been working for 18 years with the Cochiti Pueblo in New Mexico. And they've been doing summer camps um, and uh, intensive summer camps for the kids for 18 years. And, they, and she wrote saying, it's all coming to fruition now, we are opening a uh, preschool immersion school, and she wanted money. But 
So who's going to teach the children in, um, in, in these small groups that are trying to revitalize their language? You know, who is going to run these immersion camps if, if all of the speakers are very elderly? Uh, who is going to, um, at what, how are the parents going to learn the language that want to use the language at home? Uh, how is all this going to happen? Who's going to teach those language classes in the schools? Well, the smaller uh, endangered languages have few, if any, adult speakers who are of parent age or professional age. These are the missing generations. Those are the ones who didn't learn the language when they were the children. So right now, most of these uh, languages, at least in California, um, that are deeply endangered have people only of like the great grandparent age. However, these generations, the missing generations, are they're not missing from action. They're only missing from knowing the language. They're the language activists. They're the people who know what it means not to have their heritage language, and they want it for their children. The challenge then is for these adults to have a way to learn their language. And so we finally get back to the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program, uh, which uh, is one way that people can learn their language, adults can learn their language. So the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program, and, and that is the book that uh, Sarah mentioned, the um, manual for it, How to Keep Your Language Alive, was developed by the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival around 1992. And these are us, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. Um, everybody here is a, a tribal member of some California Indian group, except for Marina Drummer, who's the uh, financial administrator, and I'm on, and I'm the advisory board. So the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program is a is a kind of an informal method for adults that's designed for people to do it um, more or less by themselves most of the time. So they don't have an actual teacher, but it's a speaker and a learner that are supposed to spend, if possible, 10 to 20 hours a week together or more. Uh, it's aimed at helping people learn how to learn from a fluent speaker who's not necessarily a trained language teacher. And it's aimed at helping learners gain conversational proficiency uh, in their heritage language through, through language immersion practices and doing activities that are relevant to their daily lives so that they're learning language in, in situations where they can use it in their daily lives. This is uh, just a picture of one training. Uh, <clears throat> we've done, uh, we've trained about 100 teams now in California and some, in somewhere around 30 languages. And um, we also are giving trainings elsewhere in the U.S. and Canada. And um, it, it's, as it gets more popular, it's also, um, there's a, um, our manual has been translated into Portuguese for distribution to the tribes in, in Brazil. And there's also a, a group working on translation into Japanese for, um, uh, for use by the Ainu. And there's also an MA program going on in uh, Australia, just one, in, in Kununurra. So this is the first Master Apprentice training in Australia in 2010. And um, this is L. Frank, one of the members of the board and um, Crystal Richardson, who was an apprentice in the Master Apprentice Program and has now become one of our trainers. So Margaret Flory has been working with the Mirawang on other language revitalization and documentation proje projects and has seen it in action, as well as hearing about it elsewhere, including hearing a paper by Knut um, Olowski, who's uh, one of the linguists at the uh, Mirama Language Center where the Mirawans are, and um, <clears throat> got the excellent idea of developing some groups here in Australia who would do the training of master apprentice teams around the country. So when she asked me if, if we would mind, um, 
I said, well, no, not at all, but uh, I also told her that I happened to be coming to Australia in March with my husband, Gary Scott, and that I'd be willing to do a training the trainers workshop while I was here. And this uh, led to something bigger. So it ended up um, with three advocates, myself and, and two of my colleagues from the advocates coming over here for these two workshops, training some 40 people representing 28 different Australian languages. So, um, and we've just more or less finished them less than a week ago. So here's the group photo of the Alice Springs training workshop and the group photo of the Kununara workshop. And this is our team, training team. Um, me with uh, Nancy Steele, who's Karuk and Stan Rodriguez, Kumiai. Here's some nice uh, portraits of them that uh, Reynold took, RNLD. And um, Nancy is a, uh, both of them are long-term educators, and both of them have um, um, learned to speak their language primarily through the Master Apprentice Program. And uh, they're both really talented teachers. So uh, Stan lives in San Diego and teaches Kumiai, and Nancy lives, uh, She's Karuk, and that li she lives way up in the very top of the state. So the Alice Springs participants, um, <clears throat> this is a list of them, 21 participants representing 14 different languages. And the Kanonara participants, 19 participants, also representing 14 languages, and um, the, also the Marijuana Master Apprentice teams were present, along with Francis Kofot, who is their other uh, long-term linguist. And the linguistic support staff uh, included some of my favorite linguists in the world. Um, Margaret Flory, John Hobson, Margaret Karu, Newt Tulowski, Kath Dabrowska, Susan Putch, Francis Kofot and Jenny Bell uh, dropped in occasionally. So <clears throat> these are the, well, and Margaret organized all this over a period of about four months. I don't know how she managed, but uh, it was a, a marvelous feat. So these are the principles of the Master Apprentice Program. One is leave English behind. That's what immersion is. You don't speak the language that you're trying to get away from, you speak the language that you're moving toward, that you're trying to learn. And in order to leave English behind, uh, how are people gonna understand each other? You make yourself understood through nonverbal communication. Um, this is not master apprentice, this is much more general um, immersion practice. And so nonverbal communication includes um, gestures and facial expressions and actions and um, objects and pictures and activities, uh, all of which communicate the meaning while the words are being said. We focus in the Master Apprentice Program on oral learning, um, <clears throat> not on reading and writing. So people learn to speak through listening and speaking the language. And we try to get people to somewhat minimize the use of writing um, because it actually interrupts the, the hearing and the speaking process. One of the most important aspects of it is that the apprentice is a proactive learner. That is, a, he's, he's what we have recently started to call a language hunter. This is a term that Evan Gardner developed uh, for another program uh, in language learning for endangered languages called Where Are Your Keys? And, um, and what that means is that the apprentice is going after the language. He's not sitting there waiting to be taught. And uh, we'll, I'll be explaining all of these and showing you how uh, some of this takes place. And people learn through activities. And they learn language that they can use. So, uh, and they use what they learn. And then finally, they need to teach others. 
as they learn, uh, teach, teach their children, teach their, teach a class, teach uh, other friends. So the beginning of the uh, workshops, uh, Nancy ran a grief and growl uh, session, as she calls it. So grief and growl is, uh, it's related to what's been happening to endangered languages. One of the things that's been happening in Australia and the United States is that for many generations now, people have been told not to speak their language. And they've been told that there's something wrong with their language and they've been told there's something wrong with them. And uh, 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 there's a lot of internalized anger and a lot of internalized shame that uh, kind of has to be dealt with before people can open themselves up fully to the language again. And so Nancy uh, runs a session, the grief and growl session. And uh, then, and this actually can take all morning of the first day sometimes, but uh, then we can get down to the principles. So the, the principles that I was talking about, each one of those has to be justified to, to a master apprentice team, has to be exemplified and it has to be practiced. and. Uh, and so we ran the, these training the trainer workshops in that way to try to uh, uh, justify and practice these principles. So the first uh, two principles then are leave English behind and make yourself understood through nonverbal communication. So our first uh, exercise is to um, it, it's an exercise that's also an icebreaker. We have a bunch of cards and each card has on it a task that somebody has to get somebody else to do. So the task would be um, something like get someone to give you a dollar or get someone to sit on someone else's lap or something like that. And uh, so the person who gets the card has to hide it from everybody else and he has to get somebody to do that task. And he can do it silently. He doesn't have to use language at all. Or he can use the, um, uh, the language, the indigenous language he knows so long as he tries to get someone who doesn't know that language to do the task. Because the idea is to get people is, uh, to buy into the idea that you can make somebody understand you even if you don't have language in common. So here's Phil Brown getting someone to take off her glasses and to put them on and, and to give them to somebody else to put on. Um, um, uh, Glennis Amirawan, her this is Glennis right here. Her card was uh, get two people to dance with each other. I don't know whose card this was, but it was get someone to tie someone else's shoelaces together. So this is a fun activity and it certainly gets people out of whatever depression was caused by the grief and growl. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, each exercise we do adds one principle. So the, uh, second, um, the, the second exercise is to focus on oral learning, but you're doing it by leaving English behind and making yourself understood through nonverbal communication. And that is um, an exercise to read wordless books. We have a whole collection of books that are stories without words, where everything's told in pictures. And it's a very comfortable uh, first immersion exercise because it's clear that the apprentice can understand by looking at the pictures what's uh, what the master is talking about, even if they don't understand the uh, every word. So this is Greg Pasco and his mother going through a wordless book together in in uh, the Kukuya'u language. And you'll have to forgive me if or if I pronounce things wrong here. <laughs> and uh, with John Hobson looking on and learning some Kukuya'u at the same time. Here's Jackie Allen and others at her table going through a wordless book, and her language is uh, Awabakai. That's another fun exercise. Everybody has a good time with it. Um, so we've gone through leave English behind, make yourself understood, focus on oral learning. 
And the fourth principle is the apprentice is a proactive learner or a language hunter. Now, one of the ways that uh, we help a person empower himself to be a language hunter is to um, have him learn survival questions and phrases, as we call them. And so these are um, questions like, what is this? So you have to learn how to say it in the language you're learning. Um, or the only time you can use English is with the how do you say question, where you can have a, in that blank, you can say an English word. <clears throat> or what is he doing? Uh, that's something that's good for wordless books, for example, to point to pe uh, people or animals in the book and ask what they're doing. Uh, more advanced would be something like, what is he thinking? Looking at uh, expressions on somebody's face. Uh, you can get people during activities, the activities we want to uh, say a beginning learner and uh, would do an activity where the master is uh, telling him what to do, giving uh, orders as to what to do. And uh, sometimes you have to elicit the language. The master might just say, set the table. Well, you want more language than that, you know, so you might just uh, say, what will I do? You know, and then they say, put the plate on the table. And then you put them in a pile and say, what do I do? And um, so you're eliciting more language. You're also uh, asking things like, uh, say it again, say it slower to help in the learning. Or to, uh, you have to have something to uh, overcome frustration, like I forget how to say it. If the, uh, if, if the teacher is sitting there waiting for you to say something and you can't remember. Or maybe you just need some time out. And uh, so how do you say that? Uh, also, the master and apprentice learn, both learn to have reminder phrases if they catch themselves speaking in English. One of them says, please say that in our language or let's talk in our language. So the next exercise uh, in any master apprentice training uh, is to learn a few of these sentences. We just say, learn two. And uh, we usually suggest, what is he doing and what is this? And, so, uh, and or actually, learn three and what will I do next? Because they all feed into the other exercises. So here's Dwayne and uh, Knut. Dwayne has taught Knut how to say, what is this? And so uh, uh, he is asking Dwayne, uh, what is this? And Dwayne's telling him the word for cup in the language. Uh, back to the uh, wordless book exercise, these two are asking questions about what's going on in the book. What is he doing? What is that? Okay, so that was the third exercise. So we've gone through these principles. Um, <clears throat> learning through activities. So almost everything would take place through activities. And uh, so first, uh, one, one popular activity in, um, in the workshops is making finger puppets. So uh, we first demo that. And uh, here's a whole bunch of felt and glue and scissors and things, feathers, all kinds of things like that. And uh, we, so Stan is telling us in Kumeyaay how to make the finger puppets and we're asking questions like, what is this? In order to learn languages, like in order to learn words like feather. And um, <clears throat> then everybody else starts doing it. So here's uh, Jangu and Leonie uh, making finger puppets in Nungu Buyu. Here's uh, Mirawang making finger puppets in Mirawang and in Kukuyatu. Finished products. So uh, we've gone through all these, learn through activities, and the next principle is learn language you can use. Well, of course, making finger puppets, it's sort of, uh, not an everyday activity. We'd really like people to be learning through the activities of daily life, which is harder to do in a classroom. But we manage a few. So uh, here's people getting instructions on making up the swag. Making up the swag in Wirangu. Uh, Estelle and, and Leonard 
are doing this and Estelle is uh, doing a good thing for an apprentice to do, which is uh, being reluctant to make the bed so that, uh, so that um, Leonard has to tell her every single step or she won't do it. So she's getting more language. Uh, here's making up the swag in Pacchianti. Uh, these two are laughing so hard they can hardly finish. And then another thing we did as a daily uh, exercise for daily living was uh, what do you do when you get up in the morning and you have to wash up and so on. So Stan um, <clears throat> got all of these toiletries. Actually, uh, the staff got them and brought them in for him. So there's uh, um, deodorant, um, lipstick, a brush, toilet paper, hair dryer, just all kinds of things that people might use in the morning ablutions. And of course, when a language hasn't been used for a long time, people don't have words for most of these things. So one of the issues is, well, how are people going to talk about modern life? And we always have a lot of discussions in these training seminars about new words. Um, but we've learned not to say people are using, that people should make up new words because people might feel that they don't have the authority to make up a new word. Or some people feel like new words shouldn't, we, we shouldn't be making new words anyway. We should only be using the old words. Um, so what we say is, if there's not a word for something, um, use a descriptive phrase for it. And so the deodorant might be, you might say something like, uh, um, the, the, the thing that makes you smell good, you know, or uh, toilet paper, well, you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> and so people really get off on it when they're not feeling like they're, they're making a new word, but are instead making a descriptive phrase. And it also gives them the freedom then to talk about things that people didn't talk about 50 or 100 years ago uh, and, and to not be stymied by what's going on in, in modern life, which is most of what their daily life is nowadays. So um, here's Denise taking a shower. We drew a shower on the board. And, um, so that was part of the morning ablutions and so on. So, uh, but then what we do is we go through a brainstorming on language learning activities or activities, daily activities. What are the activities that, uh, that each of the uh, participants do on a daily basis? What are the activities that, uh, what are the traditional activities that you do or might like to do? What are some things that one of you might like to learn from the other? Uh, do you like to go fishing? Do you like to go hunting? Would you like to learn to make baskets? Uh, what are these things that you'd like to do? And uh, those are the activities that a master apprentice teams would be doing. And if there's a uh, program going where the, where the uh, master apprentice team actually is being paid, you can be paid to do anything you want, right? So long as you're doing language in the process. Okay. <clears throat> The last one is and use what you learn. Now, if you're only going to talk about fishing when you're fishing, there's not too much you can say. So Newt, Newt, was, Newt was saying, oh, our master apprentice teams, they like to go fishing so much. But everybody already knows the words for all the names of the fish. you know. And so what can you do? And what you can do is, what do people do when they're doing fishing or making a basket? They're really talking about uh, something else. Most of the time, they're just gossiping or talking about what they've been doing. And um, that's what we really want master apprentice teams to be doing, is to just be talking about whatever there is to talk about. So our last uh, main exercise is conversation practice. And so Stan lined everybody up um, so that there were couples talking to each other. There were like 10 or 12 couples talking to each other at any given time. And then uh, we have a set of what we call conversation cards for people that uh, need the stimulation of a topic, of a special topic. And people can just draw a card and, and talk about that. But what we did in this case was we said, okay, the first thing is that everybody is 
each pair is going to talk to each other all at once. Everybody's talking to each other about your houses. Describe your houses. And, you, and for two minutes, no English. And most of these people are not fluent speakers that came to this uh, conference. And uh, so they were using gestures. They were often using individual words without sentences. But what we're really after in the Master Apprentice program is communication rather than perfection. We think you can think of a learner as being starting out like a baby, might be starting out with just single words and, and having to use a lot of nonverbal communication to make himself understood. And uh, he'll get better as time goes on, especially if his master's talking to him a lot and he's getting the input he needs. So we want people to uh, feel free to make errors. And um, so everybody, as you can see, pretty much having a good time doing this. They wanted to keep on. We did uh, probably 10 topics at two minutes each, leading up to five minutes each. Then um, one of the things that uh, took place then in the workshops was Knut talking about an assessment that he had done on the uh, Kananara Master Apprentice teams. And he had given um, he had various tasks for each level, of, for each kind of proficiency, for understanding single sentences, understanding stories, uh, what, uh, saying what kind of vocabulary you might know, uh, producing sentences, and being able to translate uh, uh, full sentences from English. All oral, this all oral. And, um, um, let's just go to this one. <laughs> uh, so what he found was that uh, on a score of 10, uh, on the 8th of February, or no, B, February. So these are, each one of these is, uh, is one of the people that uh, got a test. And um, this person score, scored high right from the beginning for comprehension, 8.5, but it was 9.5 by um, a year, uh, six months later. He scored uh, on text comprehension stories, he scored eight and then 10, full, full comprehension, six and then seven. And so on just about everything, they got, uh, on the average, they, they uh, improved over the six month period and improved mightily with sentence production and sentence translation from English. Um, this uh, lack or, or minus score was the only thing, and, and I think it was uh, not a fair test because what they did the, the first time was they gave 20 sentences. And then the second time they gave those same 20 sentences plus 20 more sentences that were more complicated. And um, so they, they tended to score lower, but if they had tested just those 20 sentences, they were, they were testing higher. And so they should have just had sort of separate scores for the old sentences and the new sentences. Then the last part of the uh, workshop was people getting together with the linguists and with each other um, in um, groups and talking about where they were gonna take um, this from, from here. What were people gonna be doing? Uh, what use could people make out of the master apprentice concepts in their own localities? And um, many of them are ready to start master apprentice teams. Uh, there were a number of, of people there, though, that had no speakers to their languages, so they would not be able to do master apprentice uh, exactly, but they could also use the, the concepts for teaching uh, the language. Then everybody gets. Uh, you get certificates, so each person has a photo of this. Then after that, we got to have a day off in Kananara. So Gary and I went uh, bird watching and had a real outback adventure. <laughs> got bogged down, had to abandon the car. <laughs> um, so I want to especially thank Margaret and Wallace, who I thanked at the beginning. And, and as you can see, they were active participants in the conference all the way through. And just to end, um, 
I'll talk a little bit about uh, one family in the United States. Uh, this is the this is a Karuk family, and um, they've been involved in the Master Apprentice program for quite a while, and uh, have have uh, well they were for a while, and now they're on their own. But uh, they met in college. They're both Karuk, and uh, she got pregnant unexpectedly while they were uh, in college, and it was sort of a, a stressful time because they were still in college and didn't have any money and so on. And so when she told Phil that she was pregnant, he looked at her with, as she writes, with wide eyes and said, we have nine months to get fluent. <laughs> <laughs> so they used the language at home with their uh, now three children. And, they, um, and Phil is now a teacher in the um, uh, Karuk uh, uh, class at the school, and, and, and both of them are active in summer workshops. So to me, this is, this is the goal for Master Apprentice program, is, is being able to actually use the language, hopefully with your family or with whoever. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks so much, Leanne. Um, I'm Nick Evans from the Linguistics Department in ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. And Sarah asked me to uh, take your questions and lead the discussion now. The first thing I have to say is that because this is being recorded for media, we want you to be a little patient. If you've got a question, just wait till the microphone gets to you, which may give you a few welcome seconds to rehearse exactly how you're going to ask a question. <laughs> so um, let's just open the floor now and see who wants to go first. Ah. OK, yeah, please. Mm. So the mic's coming. Um, I guess I'm curious as to the potential you have for this program. Once these people learn the language, um, there aren't, I guess, resources developed in that language as yet. So the, apart from where you have in Hawaii and um, New Zealand, using these languages in the schools, in places like the US and Australia where there are so many languages and so few speakers, what potential development could, could happen with it now? You mean for language materials? Um, <clears throat> I guess I better get to the... Well, as, as far as Master Apprentice program goes, the, um, the goal is not, of course, materials, but uh, um, putting the language back into use again. And um, that can happen, uh, hopefully, in within the community and within families in particular. But everybody that, uh, is, that has learned through the Master Apprentice program is also um, teaching somebody and they're, um, you know, they will make materials for the teaching. Um, if, and the other thing is that uh, documentation should not, despite the, uh, uh, Richard Graham's documentation should not cease <laughs> because people are using um, oral methods to learn the language. That uh, documentation through through the development of grammars, dictionaries, materials of all sorts, teaching materials and so on, um, should be occurring side by side with uh, Master Apprentice Program. And the Master Apprentice Program is never uh, by itself. Well, oh, well, sometimes it is, but uh, um, it's usually a part of what people are doing for language revitalization. Very often, for example, for example, the Blackfeet who have, uh, who I mentioned as having uh, an immersion school, are using Master Apprentice uh, program to to train uh, teachers in the language because they need because they the, the potential teachers are usually not fluent, and so they learn um, by being in the classroom and outside the classroom with the uh, 
fluent speakers. There's, um, uh, there's another group in Oklahoma that uh, is making materials, getting ready for teaching the school, uh, and using the Master Apprentice Program in preparation for that. So I don't know, am, am I answering your question? Yeah. Kind of, I guess, because there's so many different language groups around, um, I guess you've got to have the resources to continue this. So are you looking to jump or piggyback with, with governments, um, get into schools? I guess what kind of resources do you need to continue from here? Um, it might be 18 years like it is with Coach Achieve before, uh, before some of the groups will even start with, uh, with creating their own schools um, or longer. But uh, uh, funding is always an issue that comes up. And it's, um, and it's always problematic. <laughs> uh, here you really actually have a lot more government funding than we do in the United States. In the United States we have more philanthropy than you have in Australia. So we have these sort of different ways of, of finding funding. Um, and I, I think that, you know, from outside we think about all, all these languages and how can all of them ever, ever um, do anything. Well, it's primarily up to the communities. And so each community is thinking of its own community. And uh, hopefully, each community can find a way to get things done. Not every community will. And not every community in the United States is doing language revitalization. Um, some groups are, some groups aren't, and it's really up to them. Hello. I was wondering, um, what your thoughts were and also the thoughts of the, some of the people that you were working with. For example, I saw Jumama, um, David um, Newry up there in the Kananara workshop, about the use of this in communities where people might be living in a community where language is spoken all the time, but you know, different forms of language are being used by the old and the young people. So the young people are not necessarily using Creole, but they're using a different, um, perhaps less complex <coughs> form of the language. So we're hearing older people saying, we might be doing ceremony with people, but they don't understand the words. So they're living in communities where people are effectively having an immersion experience, but different languages are happening between different, at different ages. You mean, where the you mean where the immersion experience is with Creole rather than with? Well, the immersion experience is daily life where, you know, in a community like Harakun where, you know, um, Wikmunkan is just spoken all the time, but old people will speak a different form than the young people. And the, you know, the young people might be speaking a Creole, but they might be speaking a different form of the language. Um, it's changed. Yeah. Mm. It, the, um, you know, the language, the language is going to change. And um, people that are speaking the language are not, you know, they're not speaking the same way that the elders are speaking. And, this is, um, this is, of course, uh, a, um, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a problem. It's a, it's a problem for the elders. The elders hate it. It's a problem for linguists. Linguists hate it. <laughs> uh, but very often for the younger people, what's important to them is just being able to use it in whatever form they can. And I've heard a lot of people say things like, what I what I just said about communication, not perfection, was something that uh, um, that a, a Yurok uh, man who's learning his language said. He said, "I'm not interested in perfection. I'm interested in communicating in my language." And um, so, these are these are issues that every community is going to grapple with. Um, and I would say they'll have to work it out for themselves. Except that what's going to happen is the language will work it out somehow, um, ir irrespective of what people decide should happen. So th that's sort of a general answer. Um, I know in, in, um, in Hawaii, where Creole is also a factor, um, <clears throat> they don't use Creole in the schools, and, uh, but, they, but they 
accept Creole as a, um, you know, it's, it, there's a, on the Nawahi uh, website, for example, there's a section about Creole being a real language and, you know, we respect it and so forth. So it's, um, again, it's something that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that has to play a role in, in the uh, language revitalization and language use forever, I guess. <laughs> Um, just while we're passing to the next question, I, I wanted to follow on something from that because while you went through the steps in your, um, in your program, I didn't see anything where you have that sort of consciousness raising on the part of the masters, the teachers, about being tolerant of deviation and the experience I've had, I guess, in a different sort of apprentice that is being a linguist, but people vary wildly. Uh, and I've certainly heard it from a lot of people in communities where the language is very shaky, that one of the things that really put them off even trying to learn the language was cutting sarcastic criticism from older people in the community, making fun of the way they speak. Not that everyone does it, but it's common enough. Uh, and it doesn't have to have happen too many times before you give up. Uh, so I think having that consciousness raising among people who are gonna become masters in this program to say, look, yeah. you know, if you do that, people aren't gonna learn. How do you deal with it? Languages change, it's not just your language, it's, not, it, it's any language that's doing it. Mm -hmm. Is that built into the program somehow? Yeah, it was even built into my notes, but I forgot to say it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we, we have long discussions about, to, about tolerance on the part of the masters yeah. and also about getting a strong back, as mm -hmm. they put it, on the part of the apprentices mm -hmm. of, of being able to take that criticism and maybe respond to that criticism if, if they get it. And I, I agree that's often the last uh, gasp of a dying language is the person who stopped speaking it because he was criticized. I was just going to say thank you for that because with the work that we're doing with interpreters across the Kimberley and the Northern Territory, that's one of the major issues that younger interpreters talk for talked about, for example, at the IATSIS conference, the younger interpreters did a presentation called, we're just, you're just a kid from the younger generation, which is a phrase which is just often used to put people down that, you know, they're not speaking in the proper way, in the proper context. And, you know, it's a really hard job, you know, the, the sort of teasing and um, that goes on. So thank you. Right. So Jackie, we swing back to you now. Uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking about, as you were saying, the language pods, because I was thinking about the previous questions and comment that maybe one of the things that I see perhaps missing from the program as it is, is the children. Um, every immersion situation I've ever been in myself, and I've most recently been in one with Gilad, thank you, for a month of Hebrew only, Israelit, but anyway, what I was, as I was sitting listening to all of this, the word that keeps coming into my mind is maze, maze, what, what? And that was um, one of Gilad's little children. I think I learnt more Hebo from um, Giovanni and Julio, my dear, Julio, <laughs> Julio, sorry, <laughs> than I did perhaps from all the adults I heard. So I, I think, you know, again, to mitigate against this heavy criticism that adults lobby at each other in language learning environments. Um, the children don't do that. And what, you know, people say children are much better languages learners than adults are because there's some mysterious brain processes that shut down. You know, I mean, I, I've read the literature and I'm interested in child language acquisition, but I still remember a very experienced applied linguist saying to me many years ago that the problem for adults is not that their brains have changed. If anything, our brains are better learning brains. It's just that we don't explore and experiment and practice in the way children do. So I guess my addition, perhaps, I'd love, I'm interested in your comment, because often children are kept out of these sort of, uh, well, learning programs where, they're, where programs are targeted at adults. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's to the detriment often of those programs. And um, Whenever I've engaged children in any kind of teaching, exercise or learning program where it's really learning from scratch, adults tend to, you know, channel their inner child and 
behave much more freely and uh, so maybe there's a seventh or an eighth part that might they bring in the kids and channel your inner child, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I'd be interested in <laughs> Yeah, that's a really nice comment. The, um, <clears throat> the Master Apprentice program is pretty flexible. It's usually just two people uh, working together in whatever way they want to work together and learning whatever they want to learn and teach each other. And um, some of the most successful teams are, are people where the apprentice has ch children. And uh, the children, can often be part of it. They may or may not uh, be with the master apprentice team while the um, while the team is working together. Um, they will definitely be the subject of much of the learning. So, uh, people who have children whose goal is to to uh, have their children be learning the language will will be trying to learn things like how to. Uh, put pajamas on a child and talk to them while while you're getting them ready for bed, or how to change diapers, or you know all of these things that uh, that involve interaction between parent and child. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I also agree that not only are children better learners, but in some ways they're better teachers too. And um, in in every uh, alert language learning program I know of that involves children, the children go home and. Uh, teach the parents, who then come to, to the teachers in the program and say, I, I need to learn my language. <laughs> so they're very often also the uh, uh, generator of, uh, of the desire on the parents to learn the language. Now, I'm, I'm very sorry. That I know there are other people with questions, but we have to finish the formal part of the proceedings now. But as a small compensation, we are having uh, drinks and nibblies outside, so you'll get a chance to come and gather and talk and, and talk to Leanne as well. And you're all very cordially invited to that in a moment. But before do, doing so, please uh, join me in thanking Leanne for making us an uh, 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 apprentice in her own very, very <laughs> masterfully conceived program for this. Uh,